Hello, and welcome to A Week in Watches, episode 17. A Week in Watches is a series where we take a look back at the previous week of news, reviews, and stories from the wild and wacky world of watches. I'm your host, Zach Weiss, co-founder of Worn and Wound. Thanks for joining me. This week, we have a lot of tool watches. Uh, uh, that, that's really all I can say about it. These are the tooliest tool watches that I've ever tooled around. And uh, it's actually a pretty cool list of watches, so I'm excited to get to it. Also, a lot of titanium. I didn't even think about that until right now. A lot of titanium, which is great. If you like this video, find it interesting. If you enjoy this series of videos, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, it really helps us out. Um, and or leave a review if you're listening to this in podcast form. Uh, additionally, we'd love to take more questions from the audience, so please send those to info at warnerwound.com or leave those in the comment below. Like, just shoot us a question, we'll see what we can do with it. This week's sponsor is actually also the first story of this week. So, very excited to announce that our own house brand, Adapt, is launching a series of watches. This is a project that I'm particularly, personally quite proud of, as I've been uh, intimately involved with it since the beginning, and I'm very excited to, to share it with everyone. So, uh, Adapt, which stands for All Day Purpose and Terrain, is a brand that we founded in 2017, and we initially founded it with the goal of making the first fully USA-made nylon watch strap. Uh, that took us around three years to complete all of the sourcing and manufacturing, but in 2017, we launched the ADAPT straps, uh, now we call them the US made mill straps, and they are still to this day the only sort of fully American made nylon watch straps that are readily available in the market in various sizes and colors. Since we've launched it, we've expanded on that line uh, uh, greatly, we have a bunch of colors, we have a different style in our single pass, for those who prefer a little bit of less bulk on the wrist, and then we've also added in a couple of other items, including some pouches, which we call the EDC pouches uh, and folds. But it's always been our goal to grow the Adapt line. It's a, it's a, it's a fun name, it's a, it's a great concept, and we're all fans of sort of what's done in the modern sort of outdoor lifestyle space. So that has been the goal of Adapt, is to make it a modern outdoor lifestyle brand, sort of in the aesthetic vein of companies like Topo and Nike ACG, New Balance, Patagonia, the cool stuff you'll find at, you know, REI, brands that really uh, have a focus on materials, bright colors and contrast, and just really cool stuff that kind of speaks towards, towards hiking, the wilderness, adventure, and just, you know, sport lifestyle, but very contemporary to do that, but to focus it around watches and the watch world, which is, you know, what we actually know. So this week we launched the Adapt Series 1 watches, uh, which I'm just really, really excited about. So it's a bit hard to get things made this day and age, uh, that takes a little while, but it all came together and uh, yeah, we're really happy with the result. So for this project, we actually teamed up with our good friends over at Boulder Supply Co. So if you're looking at the watch and thinking, wow, that looks somewhat familiar, that is because we built it off of their venture case. And the reason why is because they made this really fantastic design. It's a 38 millimeter titanium case that's 200 meter water resistant sapphire crystal and used uh, Seiko NH35 automatic movements. And we thought that that was just really a perfect platform so that we could really work on the sort of color and branding and texture of this product for our first watch launch. Plus, we just think they make a really great project. So think of this sort of along the lines of those early Bell & Ross Bison sort of watches. Like we worked with them, so we use their case, but the rest of it is our design. So on the watch, there's new dial, there's new bezel, hands, etc. It's really uh, our design for our, all the aspects except for the case. And we really focused on this sort of bright, colorful, outdoor sort of concept. So you'll see uh, a lot of layers on it. There's a lot of textures and really sort of a vibrant use of color. Additionally, we added a bi-directional friction fit 12 hour bezel as we wanted to add uh, more functionality to the design, which we thought really worked with the whole outdoor concept. There's many other details throughout that um, I'm particularly uh, fond of and proud of, uh, but one I would like to point out is that all of the watches have customized date wheels. And from the days of 20 through 31, we actually switched the orientation of the numerals so that they are stacked to be uh, easier to read at the six o'clock date window. So there's like a lot of little playful things that we did with these watches. So 
there's Petrol, which is a combination of teals and blues with some yellow accents to it and some other sort of colors thrown in there. Carbon, which is gray and black uh, with some blue highlights and features, uh, actually some PVDing on the titanium case as well. Harvest, which is a earth tone sort of a color in, in khaki and green with, with orange accents in that. And that one's also finished with a gun metal. So that's a very like autumnal look to it. And then Terra, which is what I'm wearing here, which is a, a you know combination of orange tones with some surprising blue accents as well. All of the watches come on US made single pass straps that have been uh, customized for the watches. So they have slightly different keepers and stitching from the standards and they're all packed in EDC watch pouches. So this is like a nice little adapt set you're getting. They aren't limited edition, but they are limited batches and we have you know relatively small quantities to begin with. The the price of the Adapt Series 1 watch is uh, $449, and we're actually recording this before they went on sale, so I'm not sure if by the time that this is airing if there are any left or not, but I hope they are, and I hope that you all uh, enjoy these watches as much as I do. That's the end of the sponsored segment. And now on to industry news. We're going to start off with what was probably one of the biggest stories of the week, and that's that Omega sets their eyes on Mars. So uh, a new Omega Speedmaster is always a really, really big deal. But this year when they launched it, it wasn't your ordinary Speedmaster. This was part of the X33 line, which in many ways is sort of uh, unrecognizable from a classic Speedy. So, you know, I know when I think about a Speedmaster, I think of the, the, the 60s design that, uh, you know, went to the moon that has the curved lugs, has the three sub dials. It's really not this watch at all. The X33 is a spin on the format that is Anadigi. Uh, so these were launched originally in 1998, and they were designed sort of from the ground up to be what astronauts and pilots like, you know, really kind of wanted from a watch. And it has always had the nickname, interestingly, the Mars watch, because it was conceived of at least for uh, designed for landing on Mars. So Mars plays a role here, obviously. It's a very strange looking watch. Uh, while there are similarities visually to Speedmasters in that it has curved lugs, the rest of it really doesn't look anything like a Speedy. You know, the shapes of the pushers is a rotating bezel. It's all titanium. These really are their own watches. Interestingly though, they have earned the professional signifier, which is only on Speedmasters that have been sort of qualified for space travel. So these have in fact been worn um, on shuttle missions. They've been worn by cosmonauts on the uh, uh, International Space Station. We actually have an article about uh, Nikolai Budarin's X-33 when that went up for auction uh, several years ago. So these have some real space credibility as well. There's been several generations of the X-33. Uh, the previous generation was called the Skywalker, and that was sort of brought in a slightly more modernized aesthetic to this watch from the 1998 version. It's a little bit sleeker, had a black dial, whereas the other ones really looked sort of digital. This looked almost like a optical illusion of three hands floating on a black dial, but that black dial was in fact uh, digital. So these watches are, they're, they're, absolutely awesome they're you know the, what they do uh, they're they're just you know they're really cool these are real tool watches like these were designed as tools and for a speedmaster they definitely sort of in my opinion lack the sort of sexiness um, that we associate with a classic speedmaster which is after all a vintage chronograph this week they launched the newest generation of the x33 called the mars timer um, and now aesthetically, it's very similar to the Skywalker. Uh, the watch looks pretty much the same, but it has uh, one notable color difference. And that is that on the bezel, on the uh, main second hand, and then there's like a little line on the pusher, it's a sort of brown red color, which is meant to resemble, you know, the, the dust of Mars, if you will. This watch was designed in collaboration with the European Space Agency, ESA, and it was designed for, you know, use potentially on Mars. So it has a feature in it called the MCT function or Mars time uh, function. And Omega tells us it tracks Mars sole date and time at the prime meridian, accounting for the Martian day being 39 minutes longer than the Earth day. So essentially at the push of a button, rather than tracking Earth time, you can be on Mars time, which is 39 minutes different over the course of the day, uh, which is 
A very bizarre function, has very little uh, practical use for you and me, but if you happen to be an astronaut, perhaps training for a future Mars mission, then you can see the relevance because you have to live on a different time scale, though, you know, very slightly different at that. I don't know if this is a Speedmaster for everyone, but it is at least a nice change of pace from the standard, you know, three sub dial Speedmasters that we've seen so many variations on over the years. The X33 Mars timer is available now and costs $6,400. Next up, Christopher Ward's military collection gets a makeover. Uh, so in 2019, Christopher Ward launched uh, the original military collection. And like, this was a, this was a pretty big deal at the time. This was a, a series of watches that were officially approved by the MOD. Now only five brands get that kind of, that Ministry of Defense approval to use their actual crests and seals. So it was a very large uh, deal for the brand. And obviously Christopher Ward is British. So as the hometown brand, I think it really worked for them, but it also brought this sort of really cool uh, provenance to their watches that other brands uh, that were utilizing were really more expensive. Additionally, I think it acknowledged uh, Christopher Ward as a brand, which you know I think I've said before on the show, uh, but certainly on paper, I think is, is often underrated in both their significance and really what they can do with their watches. So there are three models at launch of those watches, one for each of the branches of the MOD. There was a C65 Sandhurst for the Army, the C65 Cranwell for the Air Force and the C-65 Dartmouth for the Royal Navy. Um, all were chronometers and all were around uh, 1K. There have been some additions to the line since, such as the uh, Agro C60 Limpstone, which is uh, probably the most aggressive watch uh, Christopher Ward has ever made. It's really neat. It has uh, dual bezels, an external bezel and an internal uh, compass bezel, and a dial that is actually made, uh, made out of forged carbon. So it's like a swirly dial that, in theory, changes per watch, which is just really neat. And then there was the Superlight C63 Colchester. So that was based on the C63 Elite line, but is forged carbon. This was actually designed for some sort of parachuting squadron. So it's, a, it's just a super cool watch. Now in 2022, those first three watches are getting a fairly significant overhaul and are being referred to now as Series 2. So they're still all chronometers and, um, you know, they're still very much based on the, on the same routes, but there are some fairly significant details, uh, changes as well. So the Sandhurst uh, remains at 38 millimeters. It's a really great size. Um, but has kind of had some dial refinements. Um, there's a different typeface, different hands, uh, a new logo. Uh, the watch was always based on the Smith's W10, which is an iconic uh, British field watch. Uh, but comparing the first version to this version, you can see the influence much more clearly in the series too. Uh, the typeface in particular just, just feels a little bit more mid-century. Additionally, they added a bronze version uh, because, you know, why not? Bronze will look really cool when it patinates and, you know, I, I think there's just an appetite for that sort of a thing. The Sandhurst Series 2 starts at 1080 in steel and that's on strap, so it's uh, probably a little bit more uh, on a bracelet, and 12 1205 in bronze, so still very well priced. The C65 Cranwell, which is once again the, the Royal Air Force model, has had the most significant changes. So the original one was 41 millimeters, and the new one is actually the same 38 millimeter case as the Sandhurst. Uh, I really liked the original one, I have to say. It was, it was a funky watch that had its own presence to it. It had a very wide steel bezel that when you put it on your wrist, just I don't know, it just didn't wear the way you had expected it to. It had just very wide and very kind of bold looking. That one had a sort of a navigator, like a type B Flieger inspired design, but in a, in a sort of a loose way. So rather than hour numerals, it had uh, minute numerals going around the track, but it was a nice companion piece, certainly to the field watch uh, Sandhurst. It was also 41 millimeters, like I said, and the larger size sort of made sense uh, for a pilot watch. Now it's smaller and um, they say inspired by the uh, GG Le Coultre Mark 11 pilot watch, which has the same roots, military sort of uh, uh, foundation as the IWC Mark 11 watches, though obviously IWC took those in a different direction. Um, it's similar to the Sandhurst. At a glance, it's quite similar, but it is a little bit more piloty, if you will. Uh, it has a different typeface on it, and uh, there's a triangle at 12. There is also on the Sandhurst, but this one has dots on either side of it. 
you know, which is kind of a typical Flieger sort of style. And now there's also a circular track around the center, a white circular track, which gives it a little bit of that type B sort of style once again. Honestly, I feel like it'd be really hard to decide between the two because they really did a very nice job with both. Neither of them looks really exactly like the field watches you're used to or like the pilot watches you typically see. They're, and they're both really nice. This one also starts at 1080. Lastly is the C65 Dartmouth. So now this one is, is perhaps most similar to the previous models, but has had some significant uh, upgrades as well. So this is based um, on the 1957 Omega Seamaster 300 Big Triangle, which you know, has some military provenance to it. It's very retro, um, is a fairly aggressive looking, and has a lot of markers on it, a full marker bezel. It's no date. Um, it has actually a fairly also limited text on the dial, which I like, particularly on the new version. It just has the twin flag logo, and it says automatic chronometer in fairly small type, which uh, I don't know, just, they all, they're all like that, but there's something about it on the dive watch, which sort of stands out. So what's different is that the previous model had a uh, aluminum bezel, and this one now features a sapphire bezel based on what Christopher Ward has learned from their Aquitaine line. So those feature these really beautifully domed sapphire crystals on them that give them sort of a vintage feel, but obviously since it's sapphire, um, they're, it's much more scratch resistant and just an absolutely like sort of a beautiful tactile quality to the bezel itself. This also let them loom all the numerals on the bezel. And then in a really cool and unexpected move, the dark blue dial is also fully loomed. You'll see there's loomed markers and then a loomed dial, but it's not like that kind of like white dial that glows. It's a different sort of uh, darker sort of tone to it, um, which I don't know. I feel like that it's just very cool looking and I feel like we'll set this watch apart a little bit and make it just a little bit more different from the previous generation. Um, it's also 200 meters like the previous generation. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, this one retails for uh, starting at 1150. So once again, a uh, pretty, pretty good price. So um, I think overall, these are pretty exciting refinements. Uh, it has been a few years since the launch of these watches. So it is sort of logical uh, next step for them to take. Um, and I, you know, I just have a feeling they're going to do very well with these. And now it's time for the release of the week. Mula celebrates the 20th anniversary of the SAR. So no, and I apologize in advance to uh, my German-speaking friends if I butcher this name every time I say it, but Nautische Instrument <laughs> Mühle Glasschut, more commonly referred to as Mühle Glasschut, um, is one of only a handful of brands from the Glasschut region. You might be more familiar perhaps with Nomos, uh, Longa & Suna, uh, Glasschut Original, Moritz Grossman, um, there's a handful of others, but it's a very small town, a lot of great watchmaking coming out of there. And Mühle is sort of a uh, its own position within those brands in that they're probably the most, uh, the only that's really sort of dedicated to tool watches. Um, I don't know if they would say they're dedicated to tool watches, but when I think about them and when we look at this watch today, you'll understand why. Uh, they make some pretty exceptional ones. So the brand itself, though, has been around uh, for quite some time, since uh, 1869, and it is family-owned and is still family-owned. Uh, I believe there's six generations of Mula at the, who have been involved in this company. They, over their history, made measuring equipment, they made speedometers, they made clocks, and it was only in the mid-90s that they actually started to get into watches, as well as uh, marine chronometers. Now. That's actually in the name, the, the nautical instrument aspect of the Mule Glashut name. And they've continued to do that to this day. They make ship clock systems, they make tide clocks, weather stations, all sorts of things for ships. And then they make their really uh, overbuilt and robust watches. So in 2002, they launched the SAR or Search and Rescue. And that was designed for the German Maritime Search and Rescue Service. This is a, a very quirky function driven tool watch. It was designed really almost by, or at least in close association with the search and rescue teams who do such things as like, you know, jump out of helicopters and freezing water to save people. Uh, so it's based around their needs for the watch. So it's a, it's a pretty extreme watch and just kind of crazy looking. It was a thousand meters. It has a rubber bumper on it, a four millimeter thick sapphire crystal, and an internally ground cyclops over the date. Uh, it was a 42 millimeter rounded design um, that has strange hooded lugs and an off-center crown, and um, I would say, like, it, no other watch looks like this. It sort of 
looked and felt like a uh, like a deep sea environment sort of shrunken and put on the wrist which kind of makes sense given what it is. So one of the things that set Mula apart that they that they do is that they actually take the e-vouches that they receive from uh, you know the movement manufacturers that they buy from um, they these come in kits they you know they 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 Put them together they finish them uh, but they also modify some of the components so one of those components that you'll find in the sar watches is, is called the woodpecker regulator and that is a regulator of their own design that essentially can lock down to be uh, to have greater shock resistance so all going towards just an incredibly robust watch um, this is a watch that I actually used to own and I reviewed back in 2013, so we can link to that. Um, I apologize for the amateurish nature of a 2013 review, but so it goes. Uh, and that's one of those watches that I that I honestly really miss. I don't know what I was thinking uh, selling that one off. Anyway, so this year is the 20th anniversary of the SAR, and actually earlier this year they released a, an anniversary model of it that was uh, solid gold which think about that watch I just mentioned and make it out of solid gold. That is just completely insane. Uh, they only made 20 of them and those went for 13,500 euros, which, you know, once again, solid gold makes sense. And this week they launched the new SAR Mission Timer Titan or Titanium. Now this is a actually entirely new design, but in the family of the search and rescue watches. So you can sort of see the DNA of that previous watch in this one, but it is sort of an entirely new design from the ground up. It features a totally different case design, uh, more of a classic case, I would say, a little more organic and flowing. Um, but still kind of funky. It's like a it's like a sort of organic looking barrel case. It's 43 millimeters, so a little bit larger. It's 500 meters versus a thousand meters, so actually a little bit less uh, water resistant. But you know, 500 meters is by far more than enough for anything that you or I could do. And apparently meets also the search and rescue standards, which is uh, far more important here. The one thing that they changed that actually quite saddens me, however, is that the rubber bumper is no longer rubber. On this model, the black ring is in fact ceramic. I don't know, I just love that they use rubber on it. I think it like added to the sort of quirky absurdity of that watch and you know, rubber makes sense. Obviously it's super tough. Ceramic's super tough as well, but you know, if you were to smash the two with a hammer, don't do that. I, want, I think rubber would probably do better than ceramic. Either way, they kept the aesthetic at least of the black ring around the around the case, around the dial. This model features a dial that is dominated by uh, very large triangles at the cardinal points, which are all fully loomed and feature uh, little like cutouts for them, like inverted cutouts for minute marks. Uh, the idea with this watch is that um, it should be legible like at a glance uh, at night or during the day. I would say this watch is, uh, you know, a really a fantastic looking watch and particularly for those people who are fans of the original SAR, it's really exciting to see a new version of it. Um, I would say it's also perhaps a little bit more generic than that original one, but in being a touch more perhaps normal looking will probably be more appealing to a larger uh, audience, which also makes more sense. Inside of this watch is the Solita SW400. I actually hadn't seen the 400 before, and that's basically a larger SW200. And because of the increased scale, they could actually use a larger date disc, which has 30% larger numerals. So this model also does not have a Cyclops as they felt it didn't need it. Uh, once again, I really like the weirdness of that last watch. So I kind of like the Cyclops, but you know, that's probably just me. At launch, they made 63 watches, each with its own case back. And each case back is dedicated to a different ship in the SAR fleet. Those versions are $3,900. They're essentially one-offs. Um, so I believe they have to be ordered specifically through Mula. Whereas the regular version that will be coming out, and I'm not sure the exact date on that, will be uh, $2,900. Very curious what everyone thinks about this watch. I, this is a real sort of Teutonic German, you know, sp uh, tool watch. Uh, very specific in its design. Um, I'm excited to see a little bit of, uh, of attention being brought its way because like I, you know, obviously you can tell I'm quite fond of the original original, um, as well as just to the brand. I, I think Mule is sort of an unsung hero of the uh, Glashut area and a brand that just in general should be paid a little bit more attention to. And that's it for this episode of A Week in Watches. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Please don't forget to head to wornandwound.com daily for reviews, news, editorials, stories, and uh, all things watches. And I'll see you here next week.